The date is June 21st, 1981. This would be the day that a baby boy was born who would later be given the name Brandon. For now, Brandon would be a mere infant in the care of his parents, Jean Yvonne and Terry Flowers. But in 20 years, he would become the lead singer of one of the biggest bands of the 21st century. Brandon would spend the first eight years of his life in the Henderson suburb of Las Vegas, Nevada. Eventually, his parents would grow tired of the city and made the decision to move their family 380 miles to Payson, Utah. The Flowers family couldn't get too cozy in Payson, however, as they moved two years later, this time settling on the town of Nephi. The young Brandon would develop a love for music. He would later attribute his love to his older brother Shane. In an interview with Spin, Brandon recalled how Shane would listen to bands such as The Cars, The Beatles, and The Cure. Perhaps Shane loved music a little too much. In the same interview, Brandon recalled how his family never attended his great-grandmother's funeral because they were waiting for Shane, who was listening to music in his room. Their mother was so upset with him that she went into Shane's room and ripped apart every single music poster he owned. Brandon was in 6th grade by the time his family settled in Nephi, but he couldn't resist the urge to return to his Vegas roots. In 1997, a 16-year-old Brandon moved back to Vegas to live with his aunt. It was there that he attended Chaparral High School and graduated in 1999. The start of a new millennium was also the start of new ambitions for Brandon. In 2001, he attended an Oasis concert at the Hard Rock Hotel in Vegas. This show made Brandon realize his calling was to be in a band, and he soon began the search for like-minded musicians. Brandon's quest led him to an ad posted in a local newspaper by a local named Dave Kooning. Dave Brent Kooning was born and raised in Pella, Iowa, where he lived with his parents, Charles and Sandra, and an older brother named Kevin. Dave spent his teenage years listening to Aerosmith and ACDC, but eventually found love with U2, especially their critically acclaimed albums The Joshua Tree and Octung Baby. Dave began playing the guitar just before the start of his high school career and joined his school's jazz band. Dave even had some experience playing for a Christian band simply called Pickle in the 90s. Dave moved to Vegas in 2000, feeling that living in Iowa made him late to all the new and exciting bands rising to fame at the time. When Dave arrived in Vegas, he spent some time working in a shoe store, but was laid off after 9-11. Dave, like Brandon, was looking to start a band, so he placed an ad in the local newspaper, listing artists The Beatles, Beck, Oasis, The Smashing Pumpkins, U2, and The Cure as his influences. Kooning later decided to remove The Cure from his list due to the strange, heavily gothic people who kept replying. Dave commented, I like The Cure, but I don't eat bats. After two months of no promising calls, Kooning was starting to lose hope and even considered pulling the ad before Brandon gave him a call. Luckily for Kooning, Brandon's attention was drawn by his list of influences, and Brandon decided to take the plunge. The first meeting between Brandon and Dave went well. They bonded over their similar tastes, and Dave got to share a guitar riff he came up with and recorded. The duo wasted no time writing their first song. They would utilize Kooning's hypnotic guitar riff while Brandon would focus on the lyrics. He decided to retell his personal story of discovering his ex-girlfriend had cheated on him. Because Brandon and Dave quickly went in to record more demos, Brandon didn't have the time to finish the lyrics for the song, so he decided to repeat the lyrics he had already finished. The song in question would be given the name Mr. Brightside. It didn't take long for the pair to come up with a band name. They settled on The Killers, after a fictional band featured in the music video for the song Crystal by New Order. In November of that year, Brandon and Dave went into a studio so they could start recording material for a demo. During their first session, Brandon and Dave recorded the songs Mr. Brightside and Desperate. In December, they recorded Under the Gun and Replaceable, both of which featured Kooning's roommate, Deal Neal, on the bass. The first Killers live show was held at an open mic night at Cafe Espresso Roma in early 2002. Brandon and Dave were joined by Deal on bass and Matt Norcross on drums. The prototype quartet would continue to play in venues in Vegas while they would hand out copies of their demo. The lineup for the band was bound to change, as in the summer of 2002, Norcross was fired and replaced with Brian Havens, but would later be fired as well. If the band wanted the permanent drummer, they need to look no further than Ronnie Venucci Jr. Mm -hmm. 
Ronnie Venucci Jr. was born on February 15th, 1976. As a child, he would spend his time banging on everything in his parents' house. It was only natural that he would eventually start playing drums. In the fourth grade, Ronnie performed drums in his school's talent show and won. Even more impressive was when he played drums for a live performance of Play That Funky Music White Boy at Caesars Palace when he was only six years old. In middle school, Ronnie would join the school's jazz ensemble, but would later quit over, quote, creative differences. After quitting, Ronnie's father would teach him how to play guitar. By the time he was in high school, Ronnie started listening to bands such as The Cure and Depeche Mode. He would also start his very first band, Purple Dirt. In Ronnie's adult life, he started giving private drumming lessons while also playing drums for local Vegas bands. It was while performing with one of these bands, Romance Fantasy, when Ronnie met the Killers and joined the band in August 2002. As fate would have it, Ronnie's first live performance with the Killers would also be Mark Stormer's first show with the band as well. Mark Stormer was born on June 28, 1977 in Houston, Texas to parents who both worked in the medical field. The Stormer family moved to Las Vegas when Mark was just three years old. Just like Dave and Ronnie, Mark had experience playing in a jazz ensemble, in his particular case, playing a trumpet. Mark's early musical influences were ones you might not expect if you were to listen to his work in The Killers, groups such as Public Enemy and N.W.A. Later on, however, Mark would find influence from bands such as Nirvana, The Who, and Pink Floyd. By the time The Killers came into Mark's life, he had already been playing with local bands such as The Negative Ponies and worked as a medical courier. Mark became an early fan of The Killers, watching their shows regularly ever since their third gig. Mark would go on to befriend Dave, which led him to playing bass for the group. Mark and Ronnie would both first play with The Killers on August 30th, 2002 in a Vegas club called The Junkyard. The Killers offered Mark to join their band as a permanent member, but Mark was initially hesitant. It wasn't until November of that year that Mark finally accepted the invitation and joined The Killers. The original idea was for Mark to play backup guitar, with a fifth member playing the bass. This would never come to pass, however, as Mark casually mentioning that he could play the bass landed him firmly in the role, and the official Killers lineup was complete. Pick you up, the early days of the Killers saw the band rehearsing in Ronnie's garage. It was the only place where they could practice for free, as Ronnie was the only band member who owned a house at the time. Unfortunately, they would lose their practice space when Ronnie sold his house. Being a student at University of Nevada, Las Vegas, Ronnie decided to use the band room at the school as a backup. The Killers would continue their free gigs at UNLV. The only problem was that their rehearsal wasn't supposed to be free. Ronnie had to sneak his bandmates onto campus so they could use the band room. They would practice from midnight to four in the morning and head off to work at their day jobs right after. It was during these sessions that the Killers wrote early tracks that would later appear on their debut album, Hot Fuss, such as Somebody Told Me and Smile Like You Mean It. The Killers would continue to play local venues in Vegas, eventually becoming regulars at a transgender bar that was called Sasha's at the time. By chance, they caught the attention of an A&R rep who worked for Warner Brothers Records by the name of Brayden Merrick. Merrick came across the Killers demo online and decided to attend one of their live shows. After said show, Merrick offered to help the Killers get a record deal and became the band's manager. Merrick took the Killers to Berkeley, California, where they would record some more demos. They worked with Jeff Saltzman, a former manager of another iconic 2000s band, Green Day. After recording more material for their demo, the Killers sent copies to major record labels across the country. Despite this, their big break wouldn't come from America, but from across the Atlantic. Alex Gilbert, an A&R rep from the UK, had his attention caught by the Killers and shared a copy of their demo with his friend, Ben Derling. Derling just happened to work for Lizard King Records and decided he wanted to sign the Vegas Quartet. Lizard King Records hadn't met the Killers in person, but were still willing to sign the band, and they accepted. The Killers signed with Lizard King in July 2003. They then began work on their debut album that would come out the following year and change their lives forever. <laughs> 